We are continuing to follow breaking news. We first told you about at five o'clock. We've learned an off duty shirts police officer was involved in a shooting on San Antonio's west side. This happening in a Walmart parking lot. Yeah, at five o'clock we knew it was an off duty officer, but we didn't know from what department we do now. We also know two people are in the hospital and part of the access road near Petranco and 1604 is closed. Patty Santos live with the latest now, Patty. Yeah, guys, uh, the road is actually just reopened in the last minute or so. You can see that officers are still clearing the scene here. Just a few officers remaining, but this is where they tell us the shooting happened. Police believe the driver of a van pulled up to this gray sedan. The driver of the sedan, an off-duty shirts police officer, opened fire in the back of his car, was a four-year-old and a front seat passenger. The driver of the van and their passenger were shot multiple times and taken to a nearby hospital. Police say they this might have been a road rage incident that started around the corner in the parking lot of the Walmart. Take a listen. There seems to have been some kind of altercation. I don't know if it was a verbal altercation in the parking lot in the front of Walmart, but as they were leaving, that's when the shots were fired. And police say the shooter and off duty police officer stayed on the scene and called 911. At this point, the incident is under investigation. They are looking for any possible witnesses and anyone who might have surveillance cameras that might show what happened. And we want to tell you, this is in the same area where just last summer San Antonio police investigated another a fatal road rage incident that is still under investigation. We'll send it back to you. All right, a story we'll keep following. Thanks, Patty. Absolutely. Thank you, Patty. The public corruption trial of indicted ex-constable Michelle Barrientes Vela has been pushed to late summer. Her defense team able to convince a Bear County judge late this afternoon that the prosecution did not give them enough time to examine undercover audio recordings from the state star witness. The defenders Dylan Collier on the case's latest false start. <laughs> Well, this was certainly a win for Barrientes Vela's defense. Her attorneys now get another four months to analyze this case after they were able to prove to a judge that key evidence was not given to them in an accessible format. At issue, hours of audio from a small recording device set up by law enforcement and worn by the case's primary witness, former county employee Susan Tristan in the weeks before the Texas Rangers and FBI raided the Precinct 2 headquarters in the fall of 2019. Attorneys for Barrientes Vela today said they learned about the existence of the recordings Wednesday. They're related to the then constable's alleged altering of receipt logs from Rodriguez Park, and their emergence came just days before jury selection was supposed to begin in this highly anticipated tampering with evidence case. What the judge found is that after three years of the state having this case, they just disclosed and just turned over evidence that's relevant and that's pertinent. Prosecutors argued before Judge Velia Mesa that the defense has had the files since September, but acknowledged that they themselves had difficulty playing them. Judge Mesa said despite 100 jurors ready to appear Monday, she had no choice but to push the trial to late August. And now I'm the one that's going to have to tell them on Monday there's no trial today. Defense attorney Nico LaHood, one time Bear County District Attorney, had this to say about his former office. Either they're overworked or they're undertrained. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to speak to their what we call mens rea, their intent, whether they're doing this intentionally or recklessly or negligently. but. All of it is not good for citizens that are accused in our community. For the defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar will not be releasing body camera footage of a shooting that happened April 5th. An 18 year old suspect was killed and a, and a deputy was wounded. This is the first time that a 10 day timeline for releasing footage of critical incidents has been used since the sheriff agreed to that timeline in February. But in this case, Sheriff Salazar said the suspect's mother asked that the video not be released. That suspect is Robert Inocencio. Bear County Deputy Miguel Gonzalez was trying to arrest Inocencio on felony warrants when the shooting happened. Gonzalez was wounded and Inocencio killed. The head of Act for SA, a local activist group that pushed for body camera videos to be released faster, says that she understands the sheriff withholding the video in this situation. I think that this is a good practice to follow. Um, in many cases, the families do want the video released for transparency and accountability, but this is very sensitive subject and their wishes should always come first on the release of body camera footage or not. 
The sheriff says it has still not been determined if Inocencio was shot by a deputy or killed himself. A man wanted on several warrants in four different counties now behind bars. He's accused of assaulting a police officer during his arrest. According to Castle Hills Police, officers tried to pull over an SUV with expired plates driving on the frontage road of Northwest Loop 410. That's when police say the driver began to speed up. Police caught up with the SUV, tried to arrest the passenger. That's when police say he elbowed one of them in the face. Eventually, police were able to arrest the man, but had to use a taser. The man has yet to be identified by police. He had several warrants for violent felony warrants and a drug felony warrant in four counties, including Bear, Harris, Hayes and Travis. A man hit and killed by two vehicles while lying in the middle of a south side street has now been identified. According to the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office, the victim was identified as 52-year-old Sean Patrick Guy. He was hit Wednesday in the 8600 block of South Zarzamora Street around 9 p.m. SAPD says both drivers who hit him left without helping. Police say both those drivers face charges of failure to stop and render aid when they're found. The search is on this evening for a missing Texas National Guard soldier in the Eagle Pass area. There's been confusion throughout the day whether this soldier had actually drowned. Erica Hernandez has the latest update. The Texas Military Department, the Texas Department of Public Safety, as well as the Border Patrol, all working together this afternoon to try to locate that missing Texas National Guard soldier. This is all happening near Eagle Pass. What we are hearing, according to the Texas Military Department, the National Guard soldier disappeared along the river during a mission-related incident today. The Texas National Guard has been a part of Operation Lone Star that Governor Greg Abbott launched last year to respond to a rise in illegal immigration. Early reports came out that the soldier had drowned while trying to save a migrant woman crossing the Rio Grande. The Texas Military Department corrected that information, saying, quote, we are aware of reports of a fatality, although those reports are inaccurate. As of right now, that missing soldier has yet to be found. According to a Washington Post report, Lieutenant Christopher Olivares of the Texas Department of Public Safety said this week alone has been busy in this area of the Rio Grande with powerful river currents resulting in 10 drownings. The Texas Military Department has said they will release more information as it becomes available. This is an ongoing story, so stay with KSAT and KSAT.com for the latest. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. And following up to what Erica just reported today, Governor Greg Abbott releasing a statement saying his office will continue to work with all law enforcement agencies to help in the search. He also says more updates will be provided when they're available. By the year 2050, there will be more plastic than fish in the ocean. That's according to the World Economic Forum. It is important on this Earth Day to consider how plastics are impacting the world. Ursula Perry now with how it's affecting your health, too. You exercise, you eat plenty of healthy foods, but no matter what you do, you can't seem to shed the pounds. According to new research from Norway, the plastics you have all around you at your house, from food containers to kids' toys, may be to blame. I was pretty shocked and uh, dismayed that I had kind of been sucked into that whole um, you know, false sense of security with using plastics. In a study, researchers extracted chemicals from 34 everyday products, including freezer bags, drink bottles, and coffee cup lids. They found more than 55,000 chemicals and identified 629 of the substances. 11 of them known to disrupt metabolism and promote the growth of fat cells. The most common fat promoting chemicals, bisphenol A, and pathylates. They can be found in everyday plastics and can also affect human development and fertility. So what are some of the alternatives to plastic? Use glassware instead of plastic containers for leftovers. Swap out your plastic straws for stainless steel, bamboo, or even pasta and rice straws. And skip the plastic cutlery for takeout orders. You won't only be helping to save the environment, but your health too. In another study, it was found that plastics can actually leach chemicals into your food, and that can disrupt your endocrine system. It can affect your hormones that balance out your appetite, your metabolism, and other body functions. Just another thing to think about on Earth Day. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. 
Let's take a look outside with live cam on this Earth Day. 85 degrees, not nearly as gray out there, but plenty of humidity still. Had to reach for the sunglasses today, Katie. Yes, clearing happened faster today, and that was good news if you were itching to see the sun. We've had a couple of gloomy days this week, so uh, more sun, but also a bit warmer today. We made it up to 89 at the airport after a morning low of 72 on Earth Day's past, though, uh, we've seen a little bit of everything when it comes to our weather. Our hottest Earth Day here in San Antonio was in 1982. We made it up to 96 that day, and our coldest Earth Day was in 2009 with a high temperature of only 53. So a little Earth Day climatology for you there. Uh, we've still got temperatures in the low 90s over closer to the Rio Grande. It's 91 Uvalde, 91 in Del Rio, closer to Bear County temperature generally in the mid to upper 80s, 86 Port SA, 86 Rio Medina, and 84 in Bandera. It will be warm and windy this evening. Our winds will continue to gust up to about 30, 35 miles per hour, and the wind sticks around this weekend. More on that and Monday's rain chance coming up in a bit. Thank you, Katie. Let's check out traffic at Loop 410 and Cherry Ridge at 5 o'clock. This was a trouble spot because there were several stalled cars. You can still actually see a car it's kind of off to the side up against a wall there. I don't know if that's one of them. They just moved out of the way again. It's loop 410 to Cherry Ridge. Things right now moving very smoothly in both directions. Well, it all starts tomorrow. The Great Texas Air Show at JBSA Randolph, and that means there will be some road closures you'll want to be aware of. Stephen Cavazos with everything you need to know in this Traffic Authority report. If your plans are at JBSA Randolph this weekend for the Great Texas Air Show, we'll make sure to plan ahead. Now, while things look fine at this hour, we want you to be prepared because there will be a few closures and, of course, some directions. Let's go ahead and start here. If you are traveling from 35 over on the northeast side, take a turn, a turn east on Loop 1604, that is. Then you'll proceed to FM 78, take a left, and then proceed to the Air Show entrance. If you are traveling in from Church Cibolo, it's pretty simple. Turn south on FM 1518, and then and follow the signs to that air show entrance. If you are traveling in from I-10 coming in from Seguin, here are some of the directions. Take a turn north on FM 1518, then proceed to Lower Seguin Road. Take a left and then you'll proceed to the air show entrance. Traveling in from I-10 in the downtown San Antonio area, well, you're in luck. Pretty simple here as well. Turn north on Loop 1604, head to Lower Seguin Road, then take a right and then you'll hit the air show entrance. Of course, this information is already on our website. We want to remind you, open your camera app and scan this QR code that will not just have a list of closures impacting this weekend, but anything that could be impacting your commute. Again, scan this QR code and that will take you directly to the KSAT traffic page. Thank you, Stephen. Well, coming up, we're going to introduce you to a San Antonio mother putting together a special event to bring awareness to a disease that took her son's life. Those details after the break. I'm Stephanie Jimenez, and here's just a little taste of what we'll discuss tonight on The Night Beat. First up, the science behind fighting crime. That is at the center of a study that's being conducted right here in San Antonio. Tonight, we're going to look at the data that criminologists are collecting and what they're doing in another major Texas city to fight crime. Also, it's Earth Day. We're going to highlight San Antonio's main water source, and you'll also hear from the volunteers that are protecting the Edwards Aquifer in a unique way. We'll see you for these stories and a lot more tonight on The Night Beat. Thank you, Stephanie. Well, a local mother honoring her son this weekend by hosting our area's first ever walk, run, and roll 5K for spina bifida. RJ Marquez spoke to Tammy Nettles about her son's battle with spina bifida and how she wants to keep his spirit alive by helping other children who live with it too. With an infectious personality and love for life, Tammy Nettles said her son, Jay Angel Perez, touched everyone he came across. Just a very happy, loving person that um, loved everybody that he met. Perez lived life to the fullest and loved sports. His room is still decorated from wall to wall with memorabilia. The Spurs, the Razorbacks, the Astros, the Cowboys, of course. He never missed a game. It's that love of life and sports that prompted Tammy to honor her son. She organized this Saturday's first ever Jays 5K Run, Walk and Roll at Texas Ski Ranch in New Braunfels to raise awareness and funds for children with spina bifida. I did not know um, 
I was going to have a child with spina bifida until he was born. Perez lived with the most severe form of spina bifida, a neural tube defect that occurs when the spine and spinal cord don't form properly during the early stages of pregnancy. He had his first surgery when he was only three hours old. Jay died in January of 2021. He would have turned 39 on Saturday. His last wheelchair. Tammy, a registered nurse who took care of her son all his life, said most people with spina bifida do not live past the age of 40. My son passed uh, short of his 38th birthday. Um, I would just, I want to help the other children to surpass that and get the help that they need. And Tammy knows Jay is going to be pushing her towards the finish line. And I think Jay's up there cheering me on and, and making things happen. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Jay's memory going to live on in that event this weekend. Absolutely. I hope you got some good weather for it. That's a good question. A I good wonder question. if we know anybody. <laughs> uh, uh, Katie Blake joins us to uh, tell us what this a lot of stuff going on oh, this weekend. A lot, a lot. And it's going to feel a lot like spring in South Texas. It'll be warm, not overly hot, and you'll notice the humidity, but we're going to have a lot of wind each day, so it may be a bit of a nuisance at times, but I think the wind more than anything will keep it from at any point feeling too stagnant and sticky. So we do have that working in our favor. One of the many events taking place this weekend, the Great Texas Air Show. Here's your forecast for both Saturday and Sunday. The mornings will be mostly cloudy. Temperatures in the 70s, seeing some sun as we get closer to lunchtime each day. And then by the afternoon, partly cloudy skies, 80s for your afternoon temperatures and windy with gusts as high as about 40 miles per hour possible each day. Late in the day Sunday, beyond the scope of the air show and beyond the scope of the majority of your Sunday afternoon activities, we will bring in a low chance of some isolated showers and storms, but by far Monday is the day where rain is most likely, and we'll talk about that setup here very shortly. Current temperatures 83 Boulevard, 90 in Castroville, 88 Divine, and 83 in Converse. Our dew point numbers are up there. A lot of spots are in the 60s, so it is feeling muggy, but they're not too bad. They've been able to drop off a bit this afternoon, so it's a little humid out there, but also windy. Here's a look at your current wind gusts. We've got gusts anywhere from around 30 to up to 40 miles per hour. Hondo, you just picked up a 40 mile per hour gust there. So again, that wind will just kind of keep things from feeling too stagnant at any point tonight and also over the weekend. So our clouds from this morning are gone. We do have some high thin clouds moving in from the west. You may notice a few of those uh, at times this evening before the sun goes down, but some active weather they're starting to get going across parts of the Texas Panhandle. These yellow boxes are severe thunderstorm watch boxes, so some severe storms possible from Lubbock up to the Texas Panhandle and Amarillo and even into a portion of western Kansas there, but a lot of precipitation over the western United States, and this is our next storm system that will help bring us our chance of rain on Monday. Big dip in the jet stream from the west coast all the way over to the Rockies, basically. We'll just call this an upper level low or a storm system, and it's already unpacking a lot of different types of weather across the western and central United States. We have some severe weather across Texas and into Kansas. Also a lot of wind here. These pinks and tan colors uh, that are all the way over from Southern California into parts of North Texas have to do with wind. So some strong winds are likely and even some winter weather as you get farther north into parts of Wyoming and Montana. So this is a dynamic storm system that will move northeast over the weekend. So a lot of the activity stays off to our north through the end of the weekend. By Sunday evening, I'll be watching for a couple of showers and storms trying to pop up west of San Antonio and maybe even to the north across parts of the Concho Valley. But eventually that big storm system will bring a slow moving frontal boundary through Texas on Monday. And this is what acts as a spark for scattered showers and storms for us on Monday. The timing right now looks like we'll start to see our rainfall coverage increase after lunchtime Monday through the afternoon and through the evening with coverage starting to wind down Monday night. We'll keep a very close eye on that aspect of the forecast for you this weekend, so keep checking back, but just plan on Monday potentially feeling like a rainy day, but boy, we need it. And when all is said and done through Tuesday, a lot of spots, a lot of yards could see between a half inch to an inch of rain. So some really good news there. And again, we'll keep you updated this weekend for your Saturday plans. More clouds in the morning, but we'll see some sun in the afternoon. That wind will be kicking, though, both Saturday and Sunday with gusts as high as 40 miles per hour at times and then rain. 
some much needed rain gets here on Monday, guys. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. All right, if you're San Antonio's professional soccer team, how do you deal with success? You just put your head down, you just keep grinding. Yeah. That's the best you can do, yeah. And for SAFC, they also have to deal with some fatigue because they're getting ready to play their third match in eight days. Yes, no rest for the weary for sure. And the Gunslingers 2.0 are getting ready for some Arena League football coming up. People hitting into a wall, man. So, I mean, there's a lot of action. You can't run from it. So it's a very fast-paced, high-scoring, very fun league. Cody Brooks and the San Antonio Gunslingers are ready to put on a show at the Freeman Coliseum in Big Board Sports. The grind continues for San Antonio FC, fresh off beating Austin FC 2-1 to one Wednesday night in the third round of the U.S. Open Cup. SAFC will return to USL Championship play tomorrow night at New Mexico United. That's a quick turnaround and will mark the club's third match in eight days. For SAFC, it's all about recovering and the mindset of playing three matches in a short period of time. Right now, it's going to be about recovering, getting our, our bodies right, eating right, hydrating, getting sleep. Um, and then we'll be back at it, getting our tactics down. But, I mean, it's uh, three games in eight days, so there's, there's, not, <laughs> there's not too much to do to get the legs back. Uh, and like I said, it's, it's a mentality. We're going we're gonna to go. We're going to be relentless. We're going to just have to push through it. It's going to be a grind. And everyone's on the same page with that because we know that New Mexico is historically a really difficult place to play, especially for this club. And, uh, you know, we, we need to get three points so we can keep climbing up the table in the Western Conference. SAFC is number one at New Mexico going 0-3-0. Kick us tomorrow night at 8 in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Arena football is coming back to San Antonio thanks to the San Antonio Gunslingers. This version of the Gunslingers is a member of the National Arena League. They'll play a total of 12 regular season games with six of those being held at the Freeman Coliseum. Now, the original San Antonio Gunslingers played in the USFL from 1984-1985 at Alamo Stadium before the squad folded for financial reasons. Now, we caught up with the new Gunslingers this week while practicing at Sporty Soccer Complex off Old Pearsall Road to talk with them about the season, the National Arena League, and the original Gunslingers. The linebacker Cody Brooks, who graduated from Seguin High School in 2012, is familiar with the OG SA Gunslingers. The original Gunslingers of the USFL. Uh, I know a little bit about it. My uncle Al actually played on the original Gunslingers, so uh, he got to come out to one of our games last year. He was very excited to see Gunslinger football back in San Antonio. I never really watched them. I heard about it, but I never really got a, uh, got a chance to really uh, watch it. Uh, I don't know if it's on YouTube or anything, yeah. but I might have to check those out. It's a new age of Gunslingers now, so it's a different story now. Not much other than what I've seen on Google. I heard that there was an outdoor team out here that was named. They had different colors and everything like that, but it, to bring that history back here and start a new, and start a new, a new wave of history, I mean, I can't, it's nothing but a blessing. Gunslingers will host the Orlando Predators tomorrow night at 7 at the Freeman Coliseum, and tickets are available through Ticketmaster.com. All right, here's a boxing weigh-in we can all jam with. Heavyweight boxers Tyson Fury and Dillian White met for the final weigh-in today. While posing for the cameras, White started bouncing around to a dance track playing in the background, and never wanted to miss a party. Fury soon joined in. They finished with a bro handshake and a smile, the former sparring partners having fun before their fight tomorrow afternoon for Fury's belt. How about that? Now see that, yeah. that's not your usual boxing, no. you know, where Way you gotta stare friendly. each other down. Exactly. Right? Maybe they mix in some karaoke next time. <laughs> Sign spree up. Yeah, Huge no, karaoke. I don't want to. Uh, no, I'd sign karaoke. me up for maybe the karaoke, not boxing either one of those guys, though. That's for sure. <laughs> All right, KSAT Explains is coming up next. Today is Earth Day, a day dedicated to taking care of our planet, looking at ways we can better protect it for future generations. And that change can start small, caring for what we have right here at home. But in some ways, San Antonio needs to clean things up. One of our viewers sent this question to our KSAT Explains team. Hello, my name is Sean Jackson, and my, my message for KSAT 12 is, I'd like to know why our cities become so dirty. Every time I drive down the roads, I see trash and debris on the side of the roads. I've lived here for a long time, and I just see our city on a decline when it comes to the cleanliness of it and everything around in the city. And I just know that all the city council members and the mayor of the city, I know they drive to and from work every day. And I know they see the same things I do. And I'd like to, know, I'd like to have that question answered is, why is our city becoming so dirty? Thank you. It's a good question. You might have seen it too, especially when it comes to trash 
along the side of the road. Here is KSAT Explains Illegal Dumping. A mattress, a sink, a recliner, old carpet, that and more piled up here, dumped along a residential street near Loop 410 in Rigsby. My name is Andrew Gutierrez. I'm assistant director for the Solid Waste Management Department for the city of San Antonio. Andrew Gutierrez has been at this for 30 years. Contractor, debris, uh, buckets of either paint, chemicals, carpeting, mattresses, household trash. This is very typical of what you find in the legal dump sites. There's a car seat over there. I mean, it's just stuff that looks like people don't know what else to do with it. Well, th there's really no need for this because we have many options to, to dispose of, of uh, unwanted items. And yet, it still happens on every side of San Antonio, and not just on city streets, but on major highways, too. A lot of the big items that we see are maybe mattresses, uh, couches. Litter is a big problem in Texas. A big problem with a big price tag. TxDOT spent $57 million last year just on litter pickup. Now, if you think about it, that's money that can go to be, you know, repairing and even maintaining the state highways. TxDOT is responsible for picking up what's dumped along state highways. They contract with an outside service to do that pickup twice a month. If something dumped along the highway is causing a safety concern, Lopez says that TxDOT takes care of that ASAP. Sometimes items are dumped by accident or negligence. A lot of the big items that are found on the highway are coming from trucks that uh, the items were not securely uh, loaded into their vehicle. But other times, like at this dump site, junk is dumped on purpose. And on city streets, it's the city's solid waste management department that picks it up. How did you all get out here today? We uh, get a lot of our information through the public that calls 311 and reports illegal dumping to us. And so we have, we pull a list every day and, and our drivers come out and our crew comes out and we clean it up. But there are also the spots where they know illegal dumping happens again and again. Crews don't have to wait for someone to call it in. They head to those spots weekly. The best way to report an illegal dump site, call 311. So if, if somebody calls 311 and says, I've got a bunch of trash debris in my neighborhood, What's the process then? How long can they expect? That? We, as soon as we get the, the information, it's pretty immediate, and so we'll, we'll address it within 24 to 48 hours. Last year, city crews picked up 2,232 tons of illegally dumped stuff. They made 8,388 stops to check out illegal dumping. Gutierrez estimates that $75,000 to $80,000 in disposal fees that are ultimately passed on to you, the taxpayer. It all goes to a landfill. Crews try to recycle what they can, like brush, turning that into mulch. But as you see right here, there's not much items that you can recycle there. And uh, we also got to be aware of when people throw away chemicals and all that, because those things can find themselves in our storm drains and our waterways. And so they impact the environment in a negative way. If you get caught dumping along a state highway, items large or small, you can be fined up to $500. That accelerates to a max maximum of $2,000 if you're a repeat offender. On city streets, the fine is anywhere from roughly $100 to $500. But the reality? Talk to me about the reality of someone actually facing a penalty for this. Uh, the, re the reality of somebody actually facing the penalty is, is, is rare. You know, I mean, it's, you could, we've seen some, somebody's, re they've reported license plates to us and so forth, but the thing is that to prove that that person that was actually driving that car, I think that's where uh, the problem lies. And, and it's, it's done typically in the early morning hours or late at night, and so there's not really too many people catching folks doing this. In the city's most recent budget, for the very first time, funding was approved for a team dedicated to clearing illegal dump sites. 
Before, solid waste would pull resources where they could, diverting crews from other tasks. It's part of the answer to this ugly problem. As for why someone would choose to do this, answering that question is a whole lot tougher. Especially because there are alternatives. The city hosts two curbside collections for brush and bulky items every year. Four times a year, you can take large items to a landfill and dump it for free. There are household hazardous waste drop-off centers. And four times a year, those are mobile events around the city. You can also call 311 to schedule what's called an out-of-cycle collection. City crews will come pick up what you want rid of for a fee. All this info you can find at sanantonio.gov slash SWMD. It's very frustrating. This impacts everybody. It negatively affects their, their property values. It's a breeding ground for pests, uh, mosquitoes, flies, uh, uh, disease-carrying rodents. And so at the end of the day, we, we foot the bill for this, and we being the taxpayers. Now you can check out all episodes of KSAT Explains online at ksat.com slash explains or on the KSAT Plus app and look for future Explains episodes right here during the news at six. Don't dump your trash. Clean it up. Yeah. After the break, Ford issuing a recall for more than half a million of its vehicles. Find out why coming up. If you drive a Ford, you might need to set up an appointment with your dealer. Ford has announced a recall of nearly 653,000 vehicles. It includes the 2020-2021 Ford F-150, the 2020-2021 Ford Expedition, and Lincoln Navigator SUVs. Here's the problem. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration says that the windshield wipers on these vehicles may fail sooner than expected. Ford says it's had more than 700 reports of wiper problems, but none that led to an accident. You can find more details at NHTSA.gov. Best Buy recalling Insignia air fryers and air fryer ovens over safety issues. The company says some of the fryers can overheat and pose a potential fire hazard. Best Buy says it's received nearly 100 reports of the fryers and ovens catching fire in the U.S. and Canada. Some minor property damage and non-life threatening injuries occurred as a result. Customers advised to stop using these products, return them to Best Buy for a refund. More information available at cpsc.gov. Look outside right now, plenty of sunshine out there today. Look at this pretty view. We're heading towards, we hope it's a nice weekend, Katie. It is not going to be too bad, not going to be overly hot, but the wind is going to be very noticeable both days. You probably noticed it today. We've had some wind gusts up near 35, 40 miles per hour today. Similar story over the next couple of days. So if you've got outdoor plans, I was saying um, on our webcast that goes to the KSAT weather app, if you're having dinner outside, some of those napkins and paper towels may go flying. So you may need to secure those and the wind will continue through the weekend. Today's Almanac 72, the morning low up to 89 this afternoon, pushing 10 degrees above average for this time of year. We're in the mid 80s now. Winds are still sus sustained. That word always gets me near 20 miles per hour. More on your weekend, more on Monday's rain chance coming up in a few. Just in time for Earth Day, a delivery driver has set the Guinness World Record for the greatest distance traveled by an electric van on a single charge. Driver Stephen Marlin completed the 260-mile trip from New York City to Washington, D.C. The accomplishment, a collaboration with FedEx. The trip wasn't just to set a record. The vehicle had an actual delivery to make. It dropped off a sustainable cleaning product to an organic market in Washington, D.C. All right, today is Earth Day. It's also National Jelly Bean Day. While we do not know when the sweets were first created, the National Day calendar states a Boston candy maker made them popular during the Civil War. The egg-shaped mini candies have been associated with Easter since the 1930s, but since then they've come in a lot of variety of flavors. You can find them in stores for most holidays, including Halloween, Christmas, Valentine's Day. Now they have those ones where you don't know what the flavor is. Yeah, and, and you try like it game. and sometimes they're disgusting. I've heard that go <laughs> terribly wrong before. I, do, I don't, yeah. I, so I, I love jelly beans. I'm not about that game though. See, I'm just not about jelly beans. <laughs> yeah, I love I'll jelly beans. I'll pass on those.
Okay. You okay. want to break the tie on jelly beans, Katie? Um, I mean, I can go either way. Take them or leave. Okay. Oh. Right. No, she doesn't okay. want to. She's Switzerland. Switzerland. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> That's fine. I mean, it's just certain colors. Like orange is good, pink is good, red is good. Then green and yellow. No thanks. Mm. Yes. You know, you got standards. You got jelly bean standards. Exactly. That's fine. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, let's talk about. <laughs> she's got a jelly bean hierarchy. Is what she's got. <laughs> I do, I do. Um, as with every candy. Uh, yeah. Let's. Our producers like. All right. Enough. Let's get to the weather. Uh, it is 83 now in Comfort. 86 Divine. 90 in Stinson. These temperature numbers starting to come down. It's still warm out there. Our time lapse shows that we started off with more. Overcast skies first thing this morning, but the cl clearing really kicked in quicker today. Clearing kicked in quicker. Say that five times fast. Um, and we were able to warm up a bit more and see some sunshine. That's always nice. So mid 80s now at the airport and that wind is still kicking. Uh, so we've lost the puffy cumulus clouds that we had around for most of the afternoon, but we have some high thin clouds moving in from the west. That should make for a pretty sky this evening and may even give us a little pop of color closer to sunset. So we'll keep your skies mostly clear for the next several hours through about 9 10 o'clock and then as we get closer to midnight the low clouds will start to roll back in otherwise humid touch humid and also quite windy for the remainder of the day our winds will be sustained 10 to 20 miles per hour for the rest of the night and our wind gusts will continue to be up near 30 35 miles per hour and in some isolated instances like in hondo right now even closer to 40 miles per hour so that wind will be kicking tonight and also through the weekend our wind gusts will stay in the 30 to 40 mile per hour range both saturday and sunday then they start to come down early next week couple of breezy days early next week but not as windy as what it will be this weekend. Otherwise, for your weekend forecast, not a whole lot will change here over the next couple of days. Morning clouds, patchy drizzle, giving way to some afternoon sun. We'll start our days near 70, end up closer to 90 with highs in the mid to upper 80s each day. As far as any meaningful chance of rain goes, I got a little something late in the day on Sunday, primarily for the evening hours, but it's Monday that things start to look a lot better in terms of measurable rainfall that we desperately need. So I want to start off with taking a look at the severe weather risk across the state of Texas on Sunday. It falls into this lowest category, meaning just some isolated strong to severe storms will be possible essentially from the border around Valverde County, Del Rio, even down to Eagle Pass and then up to the northeast, including parts of the Concho Valley, the Hill Country up to Austin and even the Metroplex. So this is an area as we get into late Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening that I'll be watching for a few isolated storms to try to roll our direction from the higher terrain of northern Mexico and also off to the northwest coverage of of any rain late in the day Sunday is going to be low. Now Monday is a different story. A slow moving cold front will be moving across Texas on Monday and the rain is going to set up along this frontal boundary as it gradually moves south and east. As of right now, it looks like rainfall coverage will become highest Monday after lunchtime through the evening hours and then it'll start to peel back as we get into late Monday night. We'll keep a very close eye on that for you this weekend. Please keep checking back in so we can kind of get you a better idea on Monday of exactly when there will be the most rain around. Uh, this is good for us in terms of rainfall potential. More rain, potentially up to an inch of rain possible along and west of 35, east of 35, less than that. But our drought is worse generally west of 35 and west of 37. So some pretty good news there with our rainfall placement. Again, not no rain tomorrow, aside from a little bit of patchy drizzle in the morning. It's Monday that things look better for us uh, so we can hopefully start to put a dent in this drought. Keep your fingers crossed, guys. We will. Thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. In case you missed it, coming up next. And good morning. It is Friday, April 22nd. Top stories this morning. Von Army police are hoping an arrest made late last night will help put an end to a series of burglaries targeting businesses along I-35. For two months now, police say businesses have reported about a half a dozen break-ins. Just minutes after releasing the surveillance video of a person of interest, police were able to make an arrest. Police say Joshua Gutierrez Trivi is facing charges of theft and criminal trespassing. Business owners say they are doing everything they can to help ensure the suspect is put away, and they're hoping the community can help seal this case for the police.
In your top stories this morning, San Antonio police releasing new video to catch a killer. This comes nearly seven months after 40-year-old Christopher Olivares was brutally murdered. This video is from two weeks prior to Olivares being stabbed to death in his own home. You get a vague look at the suspect. The night of the murder, it's an even quicker glance. However, the suspect is seen leaving Olivares' house in his car. A few days later, that car was found burned in Guadalupe County. That murder happened back on September 25th. Olivares' mother tells us every day since has been as hard as the day she received the news. A man who evaded a deputy with prongs from a stun gun stuck in his back yesterday. Well, now he's in custody. He is 39-year-old Robert Pena. He was arrested this morning when he went to update his sex offender registration at the sheriff's office. The stun gun prongs were still intact. That's because during a struggle with the deputy in a northeast side neighborhood yesterday, Pena broke the wires from the stun gun and drove away. Pena was questioned by the deputy after someone reported him as a suspicious person. All right, I think the biggest thing you'll notice this weekend is the wind. Wind gusts both Saturday, Sunday could be as high as 40 miles per hour at times. A few isolated storms late in the day Sunday, but Monday is the day for some scattered showers and thunderstorms, lingering showers into early Tuesday, and then rain chances fall back to zero. Sarah Spivey and I will keep you updated on Monday's rain timing over the weekend, guys. All right, thanks, Katie. And thank you for watching the news at 6. See you back here on the Night Beat at 10.